Hello, welcome back to Bonaventure Time. Today I'm excited because today I am making a video on Dietrich von Hildebrand, who is perhaps my favorite author in philosophy and certainly one of my favorite philosophers. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to do a quick history of Hildebrand and show, give a kind of a background into his life. And this will help introduce his philosophy because there are some important moments in his life that really highlight and show what his philosophy centers around and why it came about and what it's responding to. So in understanding Hildebrand, um, his early life is a huge part of his philosophy because the Hildebrand family was dominated by Kantian ethics. And if you're not familiar with Kantian ethics, uh, I'll, uh, I won't go into the whole um, philosophy of it, but essentially for Kant, if you understand his motto, the th two things that astound me, the starry skies above and the moral law within, right? his ethics revolves around the idea of categorical imperatives, where the law resides within me because I make a maxim law that becomes universal for everyone. It's not subjective fully in the sense that it's only for me and it's just my truth, but it can be a truth that can be universally shared because we all share the same faculties and we can all reason to this to the reasonability of this law, this maxim law I make, right? And so Kant would deny any sort of real true relativism to it, but undeniably it's there. And Hildebrand's family really adopts this ethical method and they're dominated by it right because we're talking 19th 20th century with hildebrand um and this is after the enlightenment this is after all these different philosophical notions like empiricism rationalism kantianism or transcendental idealism if you know it by that um this is after all this so his family is very much uh caught up in this and hildebrand is not sold by kantian ethics he, by age 11, he, he notes this in his own survey of his philosophy, and, and it's noted by Alice von Hildebrand, his wife, in his biography. Um, at age 11, he has a conversation with his sister and, and challenges her on this because his sister's trying to show him that there's a relativity to ethics, and he's just not sold by this. And so his sister tells his dad, and his dad tells Hildebrand, or Dietrich, um, he's just too young when he grows up he'll understand but hildebrand uh being the fiery man he was just responds that if that's your best argument against me you can't disprove my my argument really because he's saying there has to be something objective to ethics there has to be some value um he says then it must not be a good argument um and he wanted to grow in philosophy to really build that what was that argument what was the objective grounds for morality natural morality we could say uh so that's an important figure in hildebrand's life and i'm so excited to get into this i skipped past really some fun facts hildebrand was born in 1889 uh, and and a fun fact is actually was born on the same day as edith stein uh, although stein was born two years later in 91 um, some important people around Hildebrand's life would be Jacques Martin, Etienne Gilson, two of my favorite Thomists, um, Edmund Husserl, Adolf Reinach, Max Scheler, uh, Maurice Merleau Ponty, Martin Heidegger, Jean Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir. Right? So these are all the people. Some of those people, like Gilson and, and Martin, he's good friends with. Some people, like Stein or Husserl, he knows from an academic perspective. Um, uh, some people like Reinach or Shaler were more mentors. And people like Heidegger, Beauvoir, and Sartre are people really he's just responding to because um, he doesn't agree with them. So those are people around him. And since we've mentioned those names, and when we move past Hildebrand's uh, argument he has with his family on ethics and finding objective grounds, Hildebrand starts his pursuit of philosophy there, really. And when he grows older and joins the university, he wanted and... To study under Husserl because he was attracted to the phenomenology of Husserl that he had just begun. Um, so he enrolled, he studied, and did his dissertation under Edmund Husserl, who became acquainted with Reinach and Scheler. But it, he was mostly influenced by Scheler, but it didn't happen till an important event. And this is when Husserl released his ideas, or really the, the second part of his construct of phenomenology. Um, and in his ideas, and if you're familiar with it, uh, which is hard to be familiar with because Husserl's a really hard reader, he's our author, um, he's a terrible author, you can barely understand him at times, 
Um, but if you're familiar with it, Hawthorne makes uh, a move from the sort of essentials to phenomenology, you could say, or the movement of phenomenology, where it's just this correlation, the subject is consciousness of an object, there's intentionality, um, and moves to the pure consciousness, the pure ego, right, where it transcends and bestows meaning upon objects. And when this came out, this was a disappointment to Hildebrand. Um, this would be like meeting, like, this is an analogy, um, this would be like meeting your, your role model in some sense, and then they just let you down. That's kind of what it was like for Hildebrand, Reinick, and Shaler, because here they are all about phenomenology, this movement that they think can really advance, um, and respond to philosophies like empiricism, transcendental idealism, rationalism with Leibniz and, and the Cartesian thought. And then Husserl just all of a sudden goes to transcendental phenomenology in this idealistic form of it. And they were disappointed. And before I go further, I've actually had people ask me, what's the difference between these different phenomenologies that you keep saying? Uh, so I'll just explain that really quick. Transcendental phenomenology in the eyes of Husserl, I just said, it is moving past this correlation and moving towards the pure consciousness. So it radically emphasizes suspending the natural attitude, which is sort of looking at th the existential values of objects and solely focusing on the appearing, but then radically transcending to where you bestow meaning upon the object that you are in correlation with. That's transcendental phenomenology. This differs from realist phenomenology, which is what really would be the beginnings or the uh, really what Husserl started with, but what Hildebrand, Stein, Reinach, and Shaler follow, or in Voitia. Um who's another contemporary of, of Hildebrand. Realist phenomenology really just takes these bare bones that I introduced in my introduction to Edmund Husserl um, and, and, and Stein, and it really looks at the relationship between subject and object, but it focuses on the intrinsic meaning found within objects, right? And you see this in Stein's empathy, the meaning found within the other subject, that meaning that illuminates them as in their subjectivity, but also has that profound impact in showing truths about myself in that theory of empathy. It's something right like that, where the relationship finds the meaning within the object, not like transcendental phenomenology, where in this epistemology of Husserl, we bestow meaning upon something. Not that it's right, it's not relativistic, and, and that can get confusing, but it really, there's a stark difference in that in Husserl, like he makes this example of like, the tree that, that, that the meaning I find within the tree is, um, it goes on past the temporality between the tree in and of itself and its existential values, right? So that's something like transcendental phenomenology, whereas realist phenomenology, it looks at the intrinsic meaning found in objects. And then uh, there's existential phenomenology, that would be Heidegger and Simone de Beauvoir. I've kind of talked about this in the existential video I just made, so if you want more on that, I would go check out the video, but essentially it just studies the subject um, in the state of becoming um, with the themes of nothingness and freedom. So, and with that in mind, this is why Husserl let down Hildebrand when he released that, because Hildebrand was not sold. In, and remember, his family life, that background of Kantianism and the I idealism, transcendental idealism, plaguing his family, right? This was a letdown, because in some ways he really felt like he was becoming Kantian. Um, and in some ways he did. Husserl did. Um, and so this really let down Hildebrand. And so this is when he started talking more with Reinach and more with Shaler, particularly Shaler. Shaler influenced Hildebrand in many ways in his philosophy and just in his talks with him as a friend. Um, uh, Hildebrand had an immense respect for Shaler, but he also notes in his own survey, and, uh, and uh, I, I believe Alice von Hildebrand notes this as well in her biography, that he, he was probably the man that Hildebrand critiqued the most. And Hildebrand even says that there's this a distinction to be made between Shaler's character and Shaler's writings. Because Shaler, as Hildebrand notes, was notorious for thinking of an idea and then just writing it and publishing it without any sort of critique or feedback. And so Hildebrand notes that this is why there are contradictions in Shaler's writings. Um, and, and that Shaler sometimes would be consumed so much about his own idea and would forget truly about pursuing truth. Um, those are Hildebrand's words. Um, paraphrasing. 
Um, so Shaler certainly was an important figure, but uh, it's important to note that Hildebrand critiqued him a lot. But nonetheless, Shaler did play the part of helping convert um, Hildebrand to Catholicism. And that was a big part of Hildebrand's philosophy because Hildebrand found in the Catholic Church truths that really confirmed philosophy, that really um, helped him develop his ethics, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so th the Catholic faith really uh, set Hildebrand's philosophy on fire. Uh, and more than that, Hildebrand was received in to the church where he found the fullness of truth, which, right, that is really what it is, um, where he has communion with Christ in sacraments. That's the most important thing. And that's what Hildebrand found. So Shaler is credited with uh, by Hildebrand himself for helping convert him. Um, and Shaler played this influence, and this came because Husserl moved towards that transcendental phenomenology. Things that Shaler would talk about, though, would be his value theory and, and his ethics. And this is where we'll move and sort of stop the history of Hildebrand. If you want to know more about him, I'd read Alice von Hildebrand's biography of him. I believe it's called The Soul of a Lion. Um, or you could read Hildebrand's own survey of philosophy, and you get a brief history of him as well. But we'll stop his history there, and we'll move into his philosophy. And I'm just going to introduce him. I'm not going to, this isn't a class, so I'm not going to go fully into uh, looking at the textbooks. But today I want to look just briefly at three texts um, by Hildebrand. There are more, um, but these highlight some things I want to talk about. And we'll start with Shaler, and right, we'll pick off right there, Shaler's value theory. I'm going to explain this really quick, and then we'll go into Hildebrand's value theory. For Shaler, the value theory really is just this hierarchy of values. It's not anything really complicated. Well, the philosophy behind it can be complicated, but essentially it's this value hierarchy where certain values that correspond to human nature, that are good for human nature, are higher and some that are not, right? There's a hierarchy of some things that are better for human nature and some things that are not, that are still good, but not as good. So he makes this hierarchy of values according to how they relate to the human person. Um... And that's his value theory, right? And uh, and for him, though, something in, in if we're moving to the realm of moral philosophy into his ethics, um, something analogous to sin would be like choosing a lesser value over a higher value. So so it's just this sort of disproportion of values for Shaler. And this is a big difference that we need to note if we're going to understand. Uh, Hildebrand's value theory because it, it immensely differs from Shaler's. Um, so that's Shaler's value theory. Now for Hildebrand's value theory. Hildebrand's value theory starts with three categories of importance. He notes this in his Ethics, chapter one. But I'm going to read from his Aesthetics because he also writes about it because it becomes important for him in his study of beauty, which beauty plays a big part in his life. Um, he's actually titled with Fierce Defender of Beauty um, and is remarked by many. Um, Jean-Paul II called him one of the greatest ethicists in the 20th century, and um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, then Cardinal Ratzinger, said, um, "When history looks back at the 20th century, at um, the great church thinkers in the 20th century, they will um, first remember Dietrich von Hildebrand." So, I mean, it was high praise. Um, but moving back to this value theory. There are three categories of importance. There's the first category, which is, deals with self-gratification. It's still important, but it is contingent upon self-gratification. There's a second category of importance. For Hildebrand, this is the bonum, if you're familiar with Thomism. Write something that is good, fundamentally good for me, insofar as it relates to my final end, which in Thomistic ethics would be the ultimate good. But there's a third one. And... Actually, I'll, I'll explain this third one really quick. Um, or I'll give an example really quick. Cause, uh, so the, the bonum, the second category of importance, right, is the bonum basically from Thomism. The first one, right, an example of that would be like paying a compliment, right? This is important, right? It, it's a good to give a compliment. It's a good to the human person. But it's also, it, right, it has a self-gratification tied with it. And, and, right, this importance really is contingent upon this self-gratification. Um, and, right, and even in Thomistic ethics, we even find 
in the bonin right in in its idea and taking up eudaimonism and aristotelian ethics right we see even in this value a measure of happiness that comes from the good right this is the nicomachean ethics of aristotle and in this value there's still some sort of gratification it's not contingent like the compliment like the first category but it's still there right it's still there in the bonium and we see this right if you're familiar with nicomachean ethics or thomas aquinas's prima secunda um or secunda secunda you realize that it is there in the bonium and that, that's not a bad thing right it, it, that's just how it is but hildebrand's going to note there's a third category of importance and this is his value this is an in it of itself, right? And this is completely different from Shaler's, right? And we can see that. It's something in and of itself that's important, free from insofar as it relates to a final end, although more will be said on that. And there's something interesting in this phenomenon, because in the complement, right, there's the gratification, it's important. In the bone room, right, something fundamentally good, such as eating or something like... Um, uh, you could say like running for health, right? There's a fundamental good. That might not be a good example because some people don't like running, but we'll use it. Um, fundamental good and things that relate right to the final end of man, right? You see this in the ethics, right? Such as virtue or choosing a moral action, right? That relates to my final end. For Hildebrand, the value is an interesting phenomenon because it's not just that it's good that it happened. But he's going to say something interesting. I'm going to read from his text here on his aesthetics. He says, Now let's suppose that we witness a generous action, a man's forgiveness of a grave injury. This again strikes us as distinguishable from the neutral activity of a man dressing himself or lighting a cigarette. Indeed, the act of generous forgiveness shines forth with the mark of importance, with the mark of something noble and precious. It moves us and engenders our admiration. This is important. We are not only aware that this act occurs, but that it is better that it occurs. Better that the man acted in this way rather than in another. That's the value theory for Hildebrand. Um, it's better that it happened. And in understanding, kind of elaborating more on this value, this in it, an important in and of itself, right? Um... Right, because if you understand the levels, the hierarchy of the bonum, right, the hierarchy of the bonum's hierarchy is determined insofar as it relates to the final end, right? There's a sort of proportion there. And that's what you see in, in Thomistic ethics, even in aesthetics with Jacques Maritain in art and scholasticism. The value, the hierarchy is determined by itself. The, the, the hierarchy of values are determined by the values themselves, right? This can be seen if you measure the hierarchy of a baby or the value of a baby over a value of a uh, of an animal, right? It's not insofar as it relates to the final end that you understand the 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 value and which one's higher. It's just in and of itself of the value that you understand the hierarchy, right? So, and, and your answer should have been the baby, right? It's just known to us that that baby is more important than, uh, say, a baby tiger. Right, the hierarchy, the values, deter or the values themselves determine that hierarchy. Right, it's not determined insofar as it relates to the final end. So there's another difference there, and that would be a difference that Hildebrand will make in his aesthetics versus, you could say, Jacques Martin. Although he's not just responding to Martin, and not even primarily responding to him, he's responding to many people. Um, but that, that's, that's the value theory for Hildebrand. And this is a very important thing if you want to understand Hildebrand's philosophy because it becomes very important in his ethics, as I mentioned. And the reason why that is, is if we take again that idea for Shaler, the value, his value theory that we're actually, in the case of something analogous to sin, choosing a lower value, trading the higher value for a lower value. For Hildebrand, value in his theory requires value, two things, value apprehension and value response. In value apprehension, right, you apprehend the value, that there is a value there. But then there's required response on your part, right? And this is where realist phenomenology becomes important. Um, right, and in this response, Hildebrand notes that you can choose not to respond to it. And this is something more like, um, more 
a more better explanation in the analogy of sin for Hildebrand than Shaler's value theory. Because for Shaler, really in something, you would be choosing to trade, uh, you would trade a higher good for a lower good. But for Hildebrand, it's actually an ignorance of the value of something. And so it's something more grave than just trading uh, the va trading values, right? It's, and we already saw the hierarchy distinguishes it from there as well. But in, in his moral philosophy, it's not just trading values. It's actually ignoring a value and then choosing a disvalue. So there's a huge difference there that Hildebrand makes. I'm going to stop there with his value theory, uh, or at least for his aesthetics and ethics. And I want to talk about, well, actually, I'll mention one more thing. An interesting thing that Hildebrand notes with his value theory, when we're talking about an important in and of itself, this is something comparable to what Voitia notes in Love and Responsibility with the personalist principle, namely that a good is a, is a, um, or that a person is a good to which the proper and to which the only proper and adequate attitude is love, right? They should be loved for their own sake, right? This is something similar, but in understanding this in relation to the final end, right? Because if we understand, if you're familiar with Thomism, if you're familiar with Thomistic ethics, you would understand that a will utilizes freedom to choose an object in relation to its final end, right? And something is good insofar as it relates to my final end because there can't be a multiplicity of ends, right? Sin creates a multiplicity of ends where I choose something different from relating to my final end. So is Hildebrand's value theory an important in of itself, Voitia, the loving a person for their own sake, contradicting that? No. And this, this is why, and I, I talked about this in my introduction to love and responsibility, this is why the distinction John Paul II makes in love and responsibility, apart from Kant's principle, is so important, because Kant would say they are the end in themselves. That's creating a multiplicity of ends, right? And that's the autonomy given to man. But in maintaining that they should be loved for their own sake as something subsisting, right, namely being a child of God, subsisting from the goodness and being radically dependent upon the creator, it's subsistent to that end, right? And there's a difference between saying something is good and valuable because it subsists and, and, and subsists in the end, the, namely the, and subsists from God, versus saying something is valuable insofar as it relates to the final end. And I hope you can see that distinction. And that's an important distinction to make because Hildebrand's not saying that he's not creating a multiplicity of ends because that would be very bad, especially with moral philosophy and ethics. Right? And that would totally contradict what Thomas Aquinas writes. No, what he's saying is that there's something valuable that, right, you notice that there's something valuable that is important, free from satisfaction, free from the self-gratifying, right? Free not necessarily because it relates to my final end, just in and of itself. That's what he means by that value theory. He's not creating a multiplicity of ends, but he's just showing that this is important and is free from self-gratifications, free from just, right, from insofar as it relates to my final end. And right, he talks about this in aesthetics. He doesn't say this exactly, but if you take his example, right, of this value theory and utilizing it in the case of aesthetics, you understand that, right, you don't tell your wife you're beautiful insofar as you relate to to, to my final end, right? You don't say something. Now, Aquinas and Thomas would never say something as crude as that, right? That's not how you represent Thomistic aesthetics. But the point of the matter is, and, and the point gets across that, right, the value is something that allows Hildebrand to move past just this idea of the bonum and not forget it, not contradict it, but really just talk about a different category of importance, right? He, he's really leveling his epistemology. He's really showing a distinction that there's just another category of importance. So that's just a clarification on Hildebrand and, and, and how that deals with ethics as well. So that's his aesthetics. Um, I'm not going to mention too much else because I just want this to be an introduction. Again, it's not a class, so I'm not going to right, go into really, um, you could say, <laughs> just everything. Um, it's not a class. I'm not going to lecture. You know, you know that you'd have to take notes on. This is really just an introduction to Hildebrand. But one of my actually, this is my favorite book of all time. Um, I know Love and Responsibility. I've said is one of mine, but this is actually my favorite book. 
And this is uh, in defense of purity. I, I've shown this and mentioned this in another video. I believe it was um, um, a big three in Catholic philosophy. But in this, there are some interesting things that he notes. I'm not going to go too much into reading into it, but um, I believe I mentioned this in a big three in Catholic philosophy and maybe even an introduction to personalism. Um, but something that Hildebrand notes in this that's very beautiful is the unitive aspect of marriage, right? Because for him, and you have to understand many different philosophies, um, really to understand why he's responding to different things. Also, just back note, I hope you understand how his value theory is also responding in ethics, responding to um, Kantian ethics and showing how uh, ethics is objective um, and how things are not relative. All right, back to indefense of beauty. Um, Hildebrand notes that when looking at things, right, when looking at things as valuable, right, th things that are good for us, he doesn't think, right, in developing the value theory, this becomes really important in un unlocking many things. And it unlocks in defense of purity and what he means by the will to unity or what he calls the intensio unitiva, right? Because for, for Hildebrand, there's two things in, in love, right, in between a couple and, and just in friendship in general, but especially in a couple. He says there's the benevolencia, the willing of the good, right? And here we have Thomism. And then there is the intensio unitiva, the will to unity. And the difference that Hildebrand's going to note in value, right, the value and the quality of love and marriage, right, is something analogous to, um, or as a response to something like Thomas Aquinas, who says, right, that God is the greatest good for us. Hildebrand would argue, right, in using this value theory, something, it's something to that analogy in responding to Thomas, that Actually, God is the greatest good in and of itself, right? The greatest value, right? And there's a difference in saying this, right? Because in saying God is the greatest good for us, Thomas is showing how in that he's fundamentally good for us, right? In developing this ethics from an ethical standpoint, right? You do actions according to the final end, right? I hope that makes sense why to mystic ethics, right? Or how Thomas Aquinas is working it. But for Hildebrand... If there's a value in and of itself that creates what, again, that intensio unitiva, this will to unity, and when you conform yourself to be united to this good, this value, right, and, and he's using this in marriage, but we can see this in the analogy of, of being united to God, right, that creates a fundamental relationship. That shows the importance of unity, right? And this is something that you don't necessarily get in just saying that God's the greatest good for us or something is good for me insofar as it relates to my final end because there's no sense of willing for unity or not a, a not a deep enough emphasis, as Hildebrand would say, in response to Thomas Aquinas. And yeah, that, that's, that's who Hildebrand is responding to. He's not just responding to Kant. He's not just responding to Aristotle, empiricism, and Hume, and, and Hegel, and, and subjectivism, and, and all these things. He's responding also to Thomas Aquinas because um, when Hildebrand converted, Hildebrand didn't feel the explicit need like his friend Jacques Martin to become a Thomist. He and, and he has a great reverence for Thomas Aquinas, and I, and I hope this doesn't this video doesn't make it sound like he doesn't. Hildebrand notes many times in his um, in his own surveys and in Alice von Hildebrand's biography of how much of a love he had for Thomas Aquinas. But again, we can see that even when Hildebrand respects someone like Shaler he still seeks to find the truth. Um, and I'm not saying that this is the truth and that this has to be believed over Thomas Aquinas. I'm simply just presenting Hildebrand's thought here. And this is this indeed is what he thought, and this is what he used, right, in understanding the value theory. This is what he used in defense of period to find the unitive aspect in marriage, which we actually do use in the church, um, right? There's the procreative and the unitive. Not to say that, but in the in this is playing the part of defending Aquinas against Hildebrand, right? In this case, Aquinas didn't necessarily go against this. Um, now he did say God was the greatest good for us. This is something true that Hildebrand notes, um, and Hildebrand certainly does disagree with him on that. That God is just the greatest good in and of Himself, right? 
That's a value theory showing up. But for Aquinas, right, there's many things that I think we tend to forget that are... There's what he explicitly says, and there's things implicit in Aquinas' writings. I showed this in Love and Responsibility um, in one of the videos I made, and also I think I might have talked about it in Empathy, um, where Aquinas... There are many things implicit in Aquinas' philosophy, right? He doesn't just say love is just willing the good, right? He does get that definition, but Aquinas... You know, there's many implicit things. He, in his treatise on the friendship, he talks about the indwelling of the souls, right? And so we do see this aspect of unity in Aquinas. So I hope this isn't showing that Aquinas was just lacking all this. This is just a different perspective that Hildebrand... Again, again, they do disagree on the greatest good for us or the greatest good in and of itself. But Hildebrand's, right, not just disregarding Thomistic ethics here. And I don't think Aquinas is lacking this in a sense. I would say it's more implicit in Thomistic writing, but through the use of phenomenology and, and the, the subject experiencing, right, different things, right, the experiencing of an object or the experiencing of a different subject in empathy, right, we come to different, it would, you could say new conclusions, but really in some ways it's adding on because phenomenology, I think, is contingent upon the objective reality presented in Thomistic metaphysics. So in, in, in saying all of this, there is a disagreement in Hildebrand and Aquinas, but I would also argue that Hildebrand, and, and certainly Hildebrand would say this himself, he's not going against Aquinas in every way. He goes against him in this one thing, but I would also argue that there is a deep harmony to be found in Hildebrandian philosophy with Thomistic philosophy. Um, there are certainly differences, uh, as has been noted, but... I think there's a harmony there, and I think there's a lot more there implicitly in Aquinas. And I would even say that uh, Hildebrand sometimes doesn't give Aquinas enough credit for at times. There are more things implicit in Aquinas' writings. All right, so that's Hildebrand. So we've talked about his history, his value theory, and how that really illuminates the unit of aspect in, in defense of purity. Um, an interesting thing, one last thing I really want to know, or a last couple of things I want to know, is... Um, Hildebrand's using ethics. Ethics became the forefront, and I hope right you, that you see that because of his family life that that became a reason why it became such a big thing. Um, he wrote a very interesting work. It was under a different title, but he wrote this one, Morality and Situation Ethics. And this is a very interesting response to people like um, Beauvoir and existential ethics or just situation ethics in general, right? Utilitarianism, consequentialism, right? Etc. I actually was very... Um, that uh, that philosophy influenced John Paul II, um, and right, you see that philosophy. Um, it wasn't like he copy and pasted, but he certainly was influenced by this philosophy, and he, um, you see that in Veritati Splendor and John Paul II's encyclical. In this book, it's a it's very interesting because you really see the character of Hildebrand in in many ways. Because moving just past philosophy. Or, or moving away from philosophy, Hildebrand talks about situational ethics really before it becomes a huge problem, right? Because situation ethics was taught in many universities, a lot of Catholic universities too. Hildebrand's writing this way before that. He's writing it actually as he notices it in literature. And, and an interesting distinction, I think, that I, that I want to mention is he talks about something called the tragic sinner. And he contrasts the tragic sinner from the Pharisee. And he actually opens this text by talking about the Pharisee and talking about, right, the Pharisaic attitude where, right, they use the law to glorify themselves, right? It, it's, um, right, where they, right, and you, and you see this in, in Scripture, right, the Pharisees, right, couldn't believe in Christ. They wouldn't follow the teachings of Christ. Because they held so much on to the Mosaic law and used that to glorify themselves. That they created their own, as Hildebrand calls it, pseudo-morality. Um, and they, they didn't want to face true morality when it, when it faced them, right? Like Christ, when he came down, um, right? And Hildebrand talks about the incarnation, the intrusion of God's infinite holiness. I love that, the intrusion, right? Something similar like to the language of Fulton Sheen. Right, and God comes down, and they can't face true morality, right? And, and this is something, right, to be appalled by, this Pharisaic attitude. But Hildebrand notes that this Pharisaic attitude, in rejecting it, created a sort of sympathy, or you could even more appropriately say pity, 
for the tragic sinner. A sinner who is indeed sinning, but is trying to move past his sin. And I think there are many literature, literary books that we see that highlight this, but none are actually plenty more than this, but one of them could be Crime and Punishment. Crime and Punishment shows Raskolnikov, and it shows him, right, you see this insane man, but ultimately through the book, you see him trying, trying, and, and right, you develop a sort of sympathy for the man, and especially in the beginning, even before people like Sonia come in and, and, um, and his sister Dunya, right, and, and all these different people, and, and the detective, right, um, I believe Petrovic is his name. Um, all these people coming, even before that, you, you develop um, this pity for him. And, and you, right, he's relatable, right? You almost rejoice that he's relatable. And Hildebrand talks about different ways that we, we rejoice, right? We can rejoice in a sinner, not actually rejoicing in the sinner, but there, there's evils that he talks about, different evils. We can rejoice in people for sinning because they make us feel less bad. Or the pharisaic attitude, we can just um criticize every sinner because it shows how good we are we can show the goodness of how we are he calls out the pharisaic attitude but in right in appalling the pharisaic attitude we become the pity to tragic sinner to the point where we start condoning their sins where we say that's they're way better off than the pharisee we choose them over the pharisee and maybe it's just okay right it's something like fundamental option theory which is right condemned by the church Right, where it's something, well, I love God, I'm doing this and it's wrong, but I love God, so it doesn't really directly um, relate to my final end, right? It doesn't directly relate to my salvation. Hildebrand notes this in uh, situ morality and his critique of situation ethics, that in moving away from the Pharisee, there's this pity for the tragic sinner, and we start condoning things, we start falling to something called, something like fundamental option theory. Or situation ethics, that we have to weigh everything within its context, within its own situation, right? Where the ends justify the means. And what does that sound like? Utilitarianism, consequentialism, right? And so I think that's something very interesting because in this, I think we can really understand something in, in the heart of Christian morality, right? We have to be tempered, right, in the Catholic life, especially in ethics, right, in, in living a moral life. Right? Because there's the vice, but then there's the excessive virtue. Right? An example of this would be humility, right? That's the virtue. Then there's pride, right? That's the vice. That's a sin. But there's also an, an excess, what you could call an excessive humil humility, and what we call false humility, right? That's not virtue, false humility, saying, oh, no, 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 I don't have any gifts, right? No, God has given you gifts. It's humble to recognize that God's given you gifts. Boasting of them and not boasting of the greatness of God, now that's pride. But also saying, I have no gifts, that, no, 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 right? That false humility, that sort of, um, right? You, you can even see it in a sense not re reconciling with imperfection, right? perfectionism coming out that's also not humility and so i think what we're seeing in this idea where there's the pharisaic attitude but there's a temptation sometimes to overcompensate and just start condoning the sinner right and uh, hildebrand i think that's very interesting how he make he comes to realize that um and, it, and it's fun it, that, that's a really great read i highly recommend it actually because it's really helpful to understand ethics. If you don't want to read his ethics, which I believe is like 500, 600 pages, it's a big one. Um, this one is about 150, 160 pages. So a much easier read, um, It's and you still get ideas that are core and fundamental to Hildebrand's philosophy. And you get a lot of reference to a lot of great books, like Crime and Punishment, which is one of my personal favorites. So that, that's Hildebrand's philosophy. That That's... An introduction to him and to his philosophy, his history, um, and and one more distinction I'll make that's very interesting um, that Hildebrand remarks is Christian morality. Hildebrand argues in his ethics, right? Uh, some people say right there there's moral philosophy, then there's moral theology. Hildebrand says and notes that, and this is true. I've seen this in many of my peers, and and, and over the course of history, if you study history of philosophy, you see this. Where Christian morality, right, 
it opens up to revelation, right, through scripture, right, namely things like the Sermon on the Mount, right, and this is only in moral theology. You don't discuss that in moral philosophy. Hildebrand argues, and I won't go into it because, again, this is just an introduction. I just want to share this. Hildebrand actually says that Christian morality has a place in philosophy and just studying philosophical ethics, not just moral theology, because he knows that there's something different in Christian morality that right that's not just in the wrong right certainly in the realm of moral theology but he says there's something that makes it different from other from just natural morality and, and philosophical ethics and so he actually says and argues that christian morality should be taught in ethics in philosophy because there's something different there i'm not again i'm not going to go into it i highly recommend you just read his ethics and then you'll find it um, and this is also not a class. This is just an introduction. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's really long. I know it's like 40 minutes long. But Hildebrand is a great author. And I hope this video kind of helps you put it ways, weigh his uh, philosophy into into a great context of who he's responding to, why he relates to Aquinas, why he relates to Kant, or rather responds to them, and where, where does he actually uh, stand. And so I hope this video was helpful. Uh, and I hope, I, I highly recommend it. If you, uh, I'll recommend one book, uh, The Art of Living. That's just a really great practical book. Uh, it's written by him and, and also Alice, his wife. Um, so if you're not the biggest uh, philosophy fan, you don't want just huge philosophical texts, Art of Living, that's a great book. If you're really into philosophy, his ethics is probably where you should start, but his aesthetics is also a great place to start. If you want just a beautiful almost theological book but uh, still right still philosophical uh in defense of purity is my favorite book uh I, again i hope you enjoyed this video please like it if you do i'll try to break this into segments so if you don't want to watch all of it you don't have to uh please subscribe if you have not and i hope to see you next time god bless